Okay, this is the Camel oh. website. Uh, I trust you're seeing my the web my uh, page now. You're seeing the Camel homepage. Uh, you heard me uh, talking about what's here, the 800 resources, uh, many of them based on the Encyclopedia of Earth. Uh, if you're coming first to the CAMEL website, which is not the case for many of you, uh, you can view this uh, short five-minute video. If you, I trust you can see my mouse in the middle of the page, and that's a good way to get started. You, another place to get started is to uh, explore our topic index. Okay, I just clicked on that to the left and we have about 200 topics, subtopics and sub-subtopics, and our resources are all categorized by those topics which are broken in the category of causes, consequences, solutions, and actions. So after watching the video and after looking at a list of topics, we invite you, if you have not already, to join the CAMEL community, which you can do through step two right here clicking on that and as you see it's a very short uh, application process and it will be approved uh, generate your username which is typically your own name and then you'll be a member and you'll be able to post material to the website and third is how you would add a, a resource uh, which I won't go into today uh, if, and we encourage you to post your own material once you're a member you'll become automatically an author and you can post things as you see across the top there are characterizations of materials by categories, glossaries, videos, syllabi. Just for example, I'm going to click on syllabi. And as you see, we have a number of syllabi for climate change. If you're on here, could you mute your phone, please? We're getting some noise. Thank you. Uh, these are a series of syllabi. Uh, and uh, in addition to sorting by syllabi, in this case, you have a further sorting across the left side. Three of these are college level one professional graduate. Uh, some of them are related to, two of them related to environmental justice, etc. So you can uh, find items that way. You of course can search in the usual way, uh, enter a search topic into the box. And um, uh, a whole series of things you can do through the educator's toolbox and the student resource, but that's not our topic today. Let me call attention to the fact that we are partnering with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, uh, and NSF has funded this project through their climate change education. And this is from the National Council for Science and the Environment and the Council for Environmental uh, Deans and Directors. Okay? So I think I now am going to uh, turn this over to. Let me find that page here. Uh, stop sharing the desktop, and I'm going to turn it over to our speaker today, who's Trisha, Trisha Munzer from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Ginny, you want to pass the ball to her? It's like a giant game of catch. Pass the ball, catch the ball. I got a note from someone. They're not hearing sound. Uh, Kathy French, or France, are you still not hearing sound? Well, then you wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't if you wouldn't hear so you wouldn't hear me. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, David Hassenzell, who's been the director of Trisha's graduate work, she'll be soon looking for a, a, a position. So if you like what you hear, uh, you'll want to get a hold of her, which you can do just by clicking on her uh, link uh, in her uh, module. By the way, if you're looking at her site and you want to get a larger screen, you can go to the top where it says Viewing Trisha Munster's Desktop. Go to the right where you have a download and view, and you can put in full screen or uh, view, uh, fit in viewer, and see the whole item. Okay, Trisha, take it away. All right, well, thanks for the plug, Andy. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Trisha Munster. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And since Las Vegas is entirely dependent on the Colorado River, uh, we use this module as a case study for a lot of our environmental science and climate courses, for introductory courses. And that was how it was originally designed. But it is not specific to Las Vegas. It actually goes through the entire course of the river. So as we scroll through the website, um, I'm going to point out some of the features and the links that you can find and how you can use the module. So the first part of it is just to orient the students with the Colorado River watershed. So we have a nice satellite image provided by NASA. And it shows that we have the Rockies, and the river comes down 
you can see Glen Canyon creates a lake here. It carves out the Grand Canyon, and then it comes back again to Lake Mead. And then it comes down and forms the border between Arizona and California before emptying out to the Gulf of California. And a big thing to notice is that the water, for the most part, is coming from the snowpack of the Rockies. Some of it's coming down the Green River, but uh, it has to travel through a large desert before actually emptying out to the Gulf. So that gives it uh, some unique properties because it flows through so many states. It's so highly regulated, and the fact that it's feeding this arid environment as well. So we have some questions, just where is the water coming from, where is it going, what are the different uses that it's put to, and how will climate change impact those uses? So next we have a graph that's been put together. Actually, let me scroll back up and point something out to you here. When you look at the module online, there are some live links. As I point here, you can see the, the website show up down here at the bottom. The data is coming from the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And as the years go on, you can keep clicking here to get the most recent data that's been posted. Right now, the data is active up until 2011. So this graph is a little old, but if you click on that link, you can easily update the graph yourself. I just put this graph together myself in Excel. But what you can see is just eyeballing the graph, um, we're seeing that there is actually less average snowpack in the last 20 years than what they had in the first 20 years. So you don't have to just eyeball the graph because the actual data is in the table beneath it. So the students are given this information, and then they are given a set of questions. So the first thing to check is their graph literacy. What are the units on the graph? And because the graph is labeled the way it is, it's actually in percentage of average snowpack. It's not in inches. Uh, students may ask what that means. It's usually a water equivalency in the snow. But this is an average, which means that 100% is what the average expected snowpack is. Anything less than 100 is less than average. Anything over 100 is above average. So first, we just want to check the students and make sure that they have some literacy there. Um, the maximum minimum is the next question. So just having them identify those maximum minimum. And I'm going to scroll back to the graph to show you that. There's some pretty obvious maximum here. For uh, June of 95, it was like 330% of average snowpack. And then obviously the minimum is down here. So that's what that question is asking. Again, part of it is just to check their graph literacy. But also, you can start a conversation as far as outliers and how scientists treat outliers. There's also um, a question that follows that, asking if maximum or minimums on a graph support the idea of climate change is happening in this region or disprove the idea that climate change is happening. And of course, these are just weather events. So that's a conversation that can come up from this graph as well, the difference between weather and climate. Um, and then it asks them to average out the data. They can pick any month they want, except for January and June, because those are incomplete data sets. But for any month they pick, you will see that for the first 20 years, there was more snow. And for the last 20 years, there's been less snow. So what that means is lower lake levels for the reservoirs that we use to feed the southern half or the lower basin for the Colorado River. And that's the first part, just to kind of set up how much snow they're getting and has there been change. There's a good question in here that asks if that is enough data to determine whether or not climate change has happened to this region. And, um, and the students can actually argue back and forth. What you really want to look at is the, the legitimacy of their argument in supporting their claim. So one of the things that they can say is that there has not been enough data because we typically define climate as being 30 years a trend that's happened for 30 years. And what we've seen in this is that there's 20 years of more snow and 20 years of less snow. So it might not be enough for climate, but it's a good indicator. Um, or the students will look at it and say, it's over 40 years of data. That should be enough. Um, so really, you kind of want to look at the legitimacy of their, of their argument for that claim. And then at the bottom of this unit, it's broken up into three units. You can actually click here to download um, a PDF of this document if you wanted to print it out and give it to students as homework or something along those lines. And it's been updated with uh, the most recent data. So 2010, the winter of 2010, got a lot of snow. And that's included in the graph, but it does not change 
the trend. We're still seeing that even with that extra snowpack, it does not compare with the previous 20 years. So before I go on, I want to ask if anyone has any questions about that first section. No questions? Okay. Since I'm not hearing anything back, I'm going to keep cruising on and we'll have questions at the end as well. The second section reviews that part. It says that we've got the um, less snowpack, which means less water for the different reservoirs. So there's kind of a graph graphic explaining that. And then we have some nice visuals provided by NASA showing that decrease in water. So here you can see what was part of the land, or what used to be an island is now just part of the land. So there's certain parts that you can point out that they've pointed out on the maps or on these images to really show that decline. In this particular image, they're using near infrared bands. So what is green and growing comes as dark red. So you can see what was water is now being taken over by less vegetation in these newly drained areas. So again, the lake has retreated so much that new communities are coming in. And it's not just Lake Mead. This is the Glen Canyon Dam with Lake Powell. And it gives you an outline of what the current uh, water level is compared to what the historic water level was. And they've provided a graph explaining that. So once we see the impact to the lakes and the reservoirs, we look at the river and how it's been allocated. There's a little bit of history in this. And it shows you the allocation per state in million acre feet. Um, it's important to understand that the upper basin and the lower basin get the same amount of water. And then Mexico gets 1.5 million acre feet. So people often associate the Colorado River with the arid states in the south. But they still have allocations for the northern states. They still get used. And um, for the lower basin, despite the fact that Las Vegas is right next to Lake Mead, most of the water actually does go to California. So looking at that and looking at how the water gets used, one primary use is agriculture, both for the upper basin and the lower basin. So there's some statistics on that, as well as an image of the Imperial Valley in California. You can see that this is in the middle of the desert. This gets watered entirely by the Colorado River. So all of this agriculture is fed by the Colorado River, states away. And it gives you some information with regards to the impact of agriculture to that area. I think it's one in three jobs is tied to agriculture for that area. It also talks about the fact that that Imperial Valley, which is over here, gets fed from the Colorado River through the All-American Canal. And as we cruise down, this is a satellite image showing this aqueduct, again, just through the desert. So then we have some questions. Here, as part of the assignment, there's a bunch of questions that are really meant to just be thought-provoking. And you can't necessarily find all the detail that you want, but through the student's proficient Googling skills that everyone seems to have these days, you can find out some pretty good stats. It's something like 2 thirds of the nation's winter vegetables. So if you want to make a salad in January, you're probably buying it from a farm that's from the Imperial Valley. Um, a lot of it gets exported as well. So not just the U.S., but the entire U.S. is pretty dependent on the valley as well as various areas overseas. So it kind of gives them an idea of the impact that any change in the water supply and the agricultural output of this area can have kind of to the greater country. But the idea behind that is to really look at how can these industries, the agricultural industry, adapt to climate change knowing that there has been less snowpack and that's something that is expected. And are these adaptations also mitigation strategies. Now, this has been designed as a case study. It does not actually define adaptation or mitigation for you in this module. It's meant for the students to apply the knowledge of what an adaptation strategy is or what a mitigation strategy is to this particular case study. Um, for this section, an adaptation would be something along the lines like um, changing the crops that are to drought, more drought resistant or using genetically modified crops that are made to be more drought resistant. Um, potentially changing agricultural methods so that there is more carbon being sequestered in the soil. That would be a mitigation um, strategy 
but it also works for adaptation as well because it helps retain more soil moisture and things along those lines. And again, there's a place to download this section. It's just a PDF if you don't want to work straight off the website. And again, I'm going to pause in case anyone's had questions that have come up. As we keep cruising. Okay, part three talks about urban growth. Um, Las Vegas has been known throughout the 90s and 2000s, the 2000s. Uh, there's been huge or huge growth in Las Vegas, and we have a satellite image here depicting that. You can see here's the city in 1984. It's still a large desert here, um, quite the space between the city and the lake. And then here it is in 2009. That whole desert area has been taken over. It's spread out towards the lake. And this is actually all uh, national lands that have been set aside for conservation. And you can see the city is growing right up to that land. Um, this is not new. Tucson is also growing. Phoenix is also growing. Southern California is also growing. So these urban populations are increasing the demand for water. And again, the Colorado River was allocated in the 30s. So Vegas was much smaller then. They get 300,000 acre feet. It's all of Nevada's water allocation goes to the Las Vegas Valley. And it's the smallest allocation of any of the states. So as the city grows, their demand for water grows. The allocations haven't changed since then, but it's definitely caused more conflict and stress on the, on the river. In addition to the growth of population and the need for water in the cities for landscaping, laundry, bathing, cooking, that kind of thing, uh, there's also an increased demand for energy in these urban areas. And here is a NASA image again that shows a coal generating system and all of this that's coming out shows you the amount of steam. Coal plants uh, use a lot of water for their cooling and for the nitrogen and sulfur oxide filters that they use. It requires water. You can use systems that are much more water efficient, but they are not as cost or power efficient. There's more parasitic loads and things like that. So um, these systems still use a lot of water. And that's become an increasing issue is where energy and water come together, especially in these arid climates and especially where these urban centers are growing. One note on this that someone pointed out is this image is actually upside down. Um, the river is actually north of the city. So if you flip flopped it, it would be more accurate. And you can go to Google Earth and see where that's true. But uh, for the purposes, uh, NASA actually posted it like this. And for the purposes of this module, it's irrelevant. But I just thought I would note that. So again, for the assignment, there's a bunch of questions. Uh, the first part of them are, again, thought-provoking. It's mostly the ones that have been bolded that I have my students answer. And again, it asks them mitigation strategies and can they differ, how do they differ, or are there some that are crossovers with adaptation strategies? So for cities, um, there's the idea of distributed energy that you can actually produce within the city using PVs on rooftops. That would be both mitigation and adaptation, because PV doesn't require the same water. Um, going to wind or something along those lines, changing the, the mandates of the state so that the power companies have to recycle their water or go to dry cooling, something along those lines would all be adaptation. And again, there is a, a PDF of this third module, or this third section of the module. And again, if there's any questions, or I will keep moving and we'll wait till the end. Uh, Part Trisha, four. Can you, oh. Trisha, can you hear me at this point? I can, yes. Okay. Uh, if people have questions, raise their hand because the phones are actually muted. If we don't mute, it actually gets pretty noisy. Uh, you can, uh, in the information box on the right, the participant box, which you can download if you or uh, click on the chat box. If you go to the top where it says viewing Tricia Munster's desktop, click on chat, you'll see a box and you can send a message to her, uh, this is Andy Jorgensen, uh, and uh, I, we can unmute you if you have a question at this stage. I will allow, allow plenty of time at oh, the end with everybody this mean, unmuted. Does this mean Antonia has a question? There's a little hand. I don't see a hand raised there, but maybe Ginny sees it. Ginny, would you look at the, see if there's hands raised and unmute anyone who has a hand raised? Uh, 
as I say, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions also. Sure. Uh, Stephen, do you have a question? You may go ahead. Stephen, do you have a question? Uh, what about uh, Antonia? Trisha thought she saw Antonia's hand raised. Do you want to unmute Antonia, please, Jenny? Antonia, do you have a question? No. No? Okay. No. So, Trisha? Okay. All right, Trisha, go ahead. Okay, then I will keep cruising on. So, Section 4, let me add that down to the back there. Uh, section 4 follows the river to its destination at the end. Actually, I'm going to close that off. And what we see here is a very stark line. Uh, the red, again, this is using mirror for red. So the red, the brighter the red, it's a green glowing reflectance that they're getting. Those are all crops. And those rectangles that are being irrigated by the Colorado River. Um, and then this is the state line. So this is the U.S. on one side, and then this is Mexico down here on the other side. And you can see the river kind of cruising through. The river has obviously decreased in size because most of the water has been diverted before it even gets to Mexico. We are by law supposed to give them a million and a half acre feet, and I believe we stay in compliance with that pretty good. But um, again, because of the size of the river, that water is siltier, it's saltier, uh, and it just means that they don't have all of their land here could be put into cultivation, and it's restricted by the amount of water that they actually have available to them. So there's some international policy issues that can be brought up when discussion of these types of modules. As we keep following it, again, we're playing with different wavelengths um, to show the turbidity and the different soil types. But the river's coming out. And this purple area here is actually showing where the salt water is coming up from the ocean up the river. So the river comes down, and it's pretty much dried out. And it's being fed in reverse from the ocean up the river bed. And so you can see where these salt flats and estuary areas that would be home for a diverse uh, community are actually being put in danger because that freshwater system that had been feeding them historically is no longer available to them. And there's some more information about that there. And the end of it has students um, kind of look. It, it gives you a bit of a recap. The way the policy reads right now is if Lake Mead falls before or below 1,075 feet, then the federal government would come in and they have the opportunity to rewrite the allocations and put some more restrictions on states or some more mandates on how they use their water. And that was put in in 2007 because they had years of this drought, potential climate change, and they knew that they were coming close to an unprecedented system where their reservoirs were no longer be able to supply that water continuously. Right now, the current lake level is at 1,129 feet. It's actually come up quite a lot. I think it rose 60 feet after that 2010 snowpack. Like I said, they had a, a large snowpack that year. And the, it did come up, but it's dropped down about half of that already. So if you click on this link, and maybe I actually will do that. Nope. The link does work. I think it's partly just because of my current situation. Um, but I did check the links this morning. They all do work. Um, do, do, do. But it does tell you exactly what the current level is. They go in and redo that link every month. Um, so it will tell you what the current level is. And then again, there's another link here that takes you to this other website where it gives you a graph from 1935 to now of what the lake level for Lake Mead has looked like. So you can see in comparison to its past history where the lake level is now. And what we're still seeing is that despite that snowpack, it, it's recharged the system a little bit, but we're still dropping one or two feet a month. So by the time summer comes around, because uh, we're obviously not expecting any more snow. By the time the summer comes around, we're still going to be in the drought situation of extreme measures and restrictions. So it still looks like within a couple years, we'll hit that uh, 1,075 foot cutoff. So should that happen, this assignment is kind of a hypothetical, should that happen, how would you 
what kind of policies would you put in? And it's a it's a discussion exercise with students. And it's important to note students often say that they would just give more water to the cities, but that means that you're taking water away from somebody else in the system. They need to understand it's a system and it's kind of a zero sum game. So if you take water or if you give water more to the cities, you're taking it more from somewhere else. And uh, it's a good way to connect students to their food. They actually end up eating more water in the form of their food than what they would drink or use in their house. So they have to understand the investment water means to agriculture. Um, and there's the idea that in cities we have different water laws when it comes to surface water versus groundwater. And in cities we tend to treat sewage and stormwater and things like that differently than, than they do in rural areas because it's all considered recharge. It all goes back into the soil. So um, things like paving, what does that mean to the water system? The more we pave, it's less groundwater recharge. It all runs off into the same spot. So looking at policies and, again, adaptation and mitigation factors that would come into play. And again, there's a PDF, so you can download these into four separate uh, assignments. And I've done that where I give them to them back to back within a week. And I've also done it where I use it as a case study throughout the semester, and I keep coming back to different parts of this particular module um, to illustrate whatever it is we're, we're talking about during that part of the semester. And then again, all the, the images and the links and things like that come back to these references. So if you wanted to do some more research on your own, those links are all available. And I think that's pretty much my my spiel here on it. But I definitely would love any questions. Uh, Trisha, and I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I won't be, before you jumped off there, I want to first thank you for it. Uh, Jeannie, would you unmute all the uh, participants and you'll have a chance to answer, uh, ask questions. Let me point out three things on, uh, on this page. And Trisha, if you can go down just a little bit lower from where you're at. First, I want to highlight, mm -hmm. as Trisha has been saying, you can download all this material as a PDF. So you can duplicate it and give it to your students. Everything is uh, None of this is copyrighted. Second, near the top of this page here are all the various other links that she has. She's done a great job of putting together an enormous number of resources uh, that students can use uh, even beyond what's in here. And at the, and at the, if, if you're in a noisy place, could you mute your phone? In a noisy place, could you mute your phone? Uh, and then at the bottom of this page, uh, it says return to the NCSC NASA interdisciplinary. Could you click on that, Tricia, please? Sure. sure. And this goes to our master list of, I think it's 10 modules we have. This was, The module development was funded through NASA. And if you go down just a little lower, Tricia, you'll see these are the other modules. We've had some of them already on this uh, webinar series. Okay, open it all for questions. Who would like to jump in with a question? Uh, while you're thinking of that question, let me tell you that within about 24 hours, you all participants here will receive a questionnaire. Of course, if it's not assessed, it doesn't exist. It didn't happen. Uh, so to keep our funders happy, uh, please reply to that at your earliest convenience. It's very, very short. It'll just take a couple of minutes. And we do sincerely want to hear your comments to make these even better. We have these virtually every Tuesday afternoon for the next six weeks or so. Uh, if you go to the uh, our web page, uh, camelclimatechange.org, you'll see the list of the other seminars. Uh, Tricia, uh, we have one uh, request, please. Uh, uh, please tell us a bit more about the different timelines that you have used for this activity and how you implemented the activity over those different time spans. Okay, as far as using it back to back versus as a semester long case study, I'm going to assume. Um, yeah, what we did is the first time we did it, it was meant to be one module and we gave it to them. Um, it was an online course. So we gave the first section uh, with the graphs and the questions the one week. Um, the students had the week to do it. They turned it back in. And we discussed, we went over the answers to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then as they finished one, we gave them the next one. After a little discussion, it just back to back. So it took about four weeks because it's an online course. So you, you do it in kind of weekly increments. Um, in the live classroom, I've done it where 
Again, we did something very similar. I actually had them do the first section in class with me. We had the graph up on the board so we could answer the questions together to make sure we're on the same page and uh, and give them the introduction. We talked about what it means to have less water in one part of the system versus the other, and we went over what adaptation and mitigation was. And then I sent them back with an assignment to uh, answer the questions to the following sections. And then we came back again as a class and did the fourth section where we tried to redesign the, the Colorado River Compact together as a class. And you can do that with a little role playing as well. Someone can be the farmer, someone can be in the city, someone can be from the upper basin versus the lower basin. Um, so that's good. More recently with the climate course, I've actually broken them up so they don't go in consecutive order. So when we talk about impacts of climate change to biological systems, I have them do the first section showing we have data showing that snowpack in this regional area is getting impacted, that there has been a change, and, and we talk about that. And then sections later, we go back to um, adaptation and how agriculture is a big point for adaptation. So then I give them that the agriculture section. And then sections later, we talk about uh, international treaties and, and issues that come up, and so I'll give them the last section there. So depending on which part of the climate change you're talking about, you can bring in the different sections. This question and comprehensive answer. Who else has another question? Well, like maybe somebody's typing a question. Maybe they can mute their phone while they're typing. Thank you. Trish, you want to go back to your module to put that on the screen so people can see it? And Sure. Sure. Uh, let me note uh, that under, uh, her, me note, uh, the name, under, under her, her name there are the various name topics that are categorized by. Right. Okay, I see hands on my screen. Well, here. I, I'm Teresa Newberry. I have my hand up. I don't know. Yeah. If go right ahead. Okay. Teresa. Should I go ahead? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question about uh, how you structure your uh, discussions, and it sounds like you teach, you know, both online and face to face, so they might be different. But um, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about you know, the discussion questions that you had at the end of almost every unit? How you how you structure those? Are they unstructured or? Um, you know, what are your expectations of the students? Sure. Um, well, I'll get down to the agriculture one to give you an example. Okay. Um, and again, typically with the agriculture, I've given it as an assignment. So we'll come back and usually after they've done some research, so they've at least done some Googling, you know, they've at least hit up Wikipedia. But there's also the Imperial Valley Farmers Association. There's an irrigation district that will give you some information. Um, but usually after I've given them the assignment, we'll come back and do the discussion. So they've got some of the background information already and can contribute to the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, having done that, we start off with some of these questions that are not bolded just at the top, just to get an idea of how important is the valley and how important is the Colorado River. So even if you live in New York State, you know, how valuable is the Colorado River to them? Mm -hmm. um, and you can you can just start off. I just start off by asking them and kind of free listing free listing on the board. It's very unstructured, just to kind of get things started, just to get some ideas out in the air. And then the bolded questions are the ones that I really want to hone in on. So, what are the adaptation measures? And those you're not necessarily going to find on a Google search. They have to add what they've learned from the class to things that they've run across in their own research. Um, some things they might come up with as far as just water efficient agriculture will bring things like sprinklers, drip systems, um, drought resistant crops, things like that. Um, so at that point they might need a little more facilitating to really make them synthesize those two concepts. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. That answers my question. Thank you. Other questions okay. from the group? The floor is open. 
Patricia, this is Steve Rutnick. Can you hear me? I can. A quiet, Steve. A little louder, please, if you can. Steve, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm playing with my microphone and earphones here. Is Am I hearable now? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, just a couple of observations, Tricia. First of all, great concepts, information, and suggestions. I really like it. Uh, pedagogical picking, pickiness here. <laughs> um, when you present the ideas that this is going to continue, I think it would be useful if you could drag in some of the models that have been done, as inexact as they may be. And I'm sure you do it elsewhere in the course. But for reinforcement, I, I would put some of them into this module as well to suggest where it's going by modeling, not just by where we are currently. And the other point okay. that really is picky is when you said that it doesn't matter that the uh, photo is upside down. Yes, it does. <laughs> because you end up focusing on that. And I think students would, and I sure did, saying, hmm, that seems wrong. Well, unfortunately, anyway, I can't. My... <laughs> yeah, I can't. I tried to go in and manipulate it, but I can't flip it because it actually came off of NASA that way. Um, uh, you can, if you prefer, you can go to Google Earth and do a screen mm -hmm. capture, but I couldn't sure. get it the level that we need to put it up on the website. It doesn't. Okay. It's not as crisp as I needed to do. Trisha, could, uh, could you put a north and an arrow pointing down to? It's clue, already on there. Difference? It's already on there. Okay. North arrow is on there, but uh, you still end up looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> See, here's the north. Um, so it's on there, but oh, yeah, see. which is why I wanted to point it out. If that's um, Anyway, thank you. As I said, picky, picky. Uh, but thanks. <laughs> I honey. appreciate it. If you noticed that other people would do. Right. Other questions? <laughs> or questions about CAMEL in general? Hope you join us for future uh, webinars are every Tuesday at 3, and then we have a special one on uh, Monday, uh, April 30th at 3 o'clock. Sign up is the same place you signed up for this one.